There we go. Welcome to Silent Book Club author chats. Uh, my name is Laura Gluhanek, co-founder of Silent Book Club. With me is Guinevere, also my co-founder. And joining us today, uh, we have two writers, which is so exciting. Um, we have Ali Frank and Asha Yeomans. Uh, together, they wrote Tiny Imperfections, which is an absolutely delightful, delightful romp of a book. Um, Asha and Ali, thank you so much for being here. Um, first, I would just love to kick this off to hear how you both met and, and kind of your backgrounds. Um, Asha, why don't you start? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us, Laura and Guinevere, um, and all the book club members. It's good to see all your faces. Um, I am a long time Seattle resident. I've been here my whole life. And I am the daughter of a, an educational pioneer. My dad's name is TJ Vassar, and he was the very first graduate of Lakeside School here in Seattle, Washington, which is a premier private school in the Northwest. And he went on to graduate from Harvard University and also the University of Washington. And um, he was the very first and youngest uh, school board president, the first black president of the Seattle Public School Board for two terms, and the first commissioner of African American Affairs of Washington State. And um, just had a real influence on education and diversity, uh, not only in this nation, but worldwide. He went around the world speaking to schools um, on the issues of diversity, equity, and justice um, in education. And uh, before him, my grandmother was a pioneer as well. She's one of the original Rosie the Riveters. And she worked um, for Boeing for over 35 years. She was actually a riveter and she worked on the bucking system. Uh, she answered the call for women to work in the um, industries when men went away to war and she came to Seattle and uh, met my grandfather who was a boatswain's mate in the Navy and they settled here. Um, I also am, you know, have some firsts in my background. I'm the first second generation graduate of Lakeside School and I went on to UC Berkeley and 20 years in education. I'm married, I have two sons and I met Allie at a small private school here in Seattle where all four of our kids um, attended and one more of Allie's daughters is still there. And we met on the admissions team there and uh, Allie, why don't you pick it up from there? Um, well, I kind of feel like the boring sidekick next, next to Asha, but um, just a little of my background, super eclectic. So my parents were actually two of the first five um, white professors at Jackson State University in Mississippi when it was a historically black college in the late 60s. And that was sort of their contribution and their time to spend and be involved in, in the civil rights movement. And then um, the time came where they were either choosing to move to New York City or to rural Washington, two drastically different opportunities. And um, I sort of laugh because I, we ended up in rural Washington, but I sometimes wonder what I would have been like if I'd grown up in Manhattan. But grew up in a very rural farming community. I was um, a Western States barrel racing champion in the rodeo. And while Asha was busy um, at the premier, the premier Pacific Northwest private school in Lakeside, I went to your average rural um, public schools and I was a little bit of a square peg in a round hole. I was a very academic child and ended up going back east. Um, I was young for my graduating age and I went back east to school. I went to Cornell for undergraduate moved to San Francisco and worked and had a quarter life crisis <laughs> at age 26. I was working in advertising and thought, who really cares about this? And ended up going back to Stanford to get my master's in education and was a high school teacher for a long time. I've taught in public schools. I've taught in charter schools. Well, actually more consulted and taught and worked with faculty in charter schools and have also been in private schools. And Asha, like Asha mentioned, we, I was in the Bay Area for 22 years and then we moved to Seattle and Asha was the pre-K teacher 
at the school and I was the assistant head of school and we were indeed on the admissions committee, which is very serious work, but not without its humor, or at least not without its humor to Asha and I. We had very similar senses of humor. We're not sure everyone else shared and enjoyed it, but on long, long Saturdays, uh, it got us through the work. But we would often joke in the pre-K kitchen, like, oh my gosh, one day when we write a book, this story should go in it, or this story should go in it. But we never really had any we were never serious one day when we write a book. That was just sort of a saying we had. But Asha went on to um, start a catering company. And a year or two later, I left the school to found another private school. And in my, when I was founding this other private school, I was do, uh, visiting schools all over the West Coast. And I was visiting this one particular private school where the the whole school had just been completely remodeled and the interiors were very very pale everything was very pale yellow um, very blonde wood and uh really soft white and the director of admissions of the school was this just statuesque gorgeous black woman and the school happens to be one that is exceedingly popular and there's all these parents that want to be in there and I was at the school visiting and I was talking to the director of admissions and it just struck me her her blackness and there were all these white parents around her like scurrying trying to get her attention and I thought god how interesting this dynamic of a woman of color holding the keys to the kingdom and I just got really excited about the idea um, but I didn't want to write the book by myself because I had attempted to write a book by myself and found it really boring and isolating. So in a, my very unelegant way, unelegant, that's not even a word. Asha, you should correct me. You're the grammar in woman in our group. You should say it right. Inelegant. Inelegant. In my very inelegant way, I called Asha up with my enthusiasm. I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, let's get together. Let's like talk about race and write a book. And, <laughs> and Asha, I picked up the phone. I said, "Who is this?" <laughs> I didn't even say who I was. I was so excited at the idea, but luckily Asha had um, has a big heart. And what it was like two days later, we met at a coffee shop in Seattle. I shared the idea, and from that day to when Penguin Random House bought the book, it was fourteen months exactly. And we just, we were really fortunate that we were both 100% committed to the project. Wow. And we that's, busted our tails to get it done. That's such a great story. Asha, what made you say yes? Yeah, what did make you say yes, Asha? <laughs> well, you know, I do remember all that, those conversations in, our, in my classroom. Um, Allie was a lot of fun when we would work together, and my classroom was about fun. And I knew she was in it when at the end of every special birthday party that I give to each and every student, I could hear Allie, soon as I put on Who Let the Dogs Out during the dance party, here comes Allie, clomp, clomp, clomping in her wooden clogs down the stairs from her office to join us. Um, I knew we could work together and have a good time, I didn't know anything about writing a book with somebody, but I think that was the beauty in us just jumping in and doing it, especially in our 40s. I mean, you get to be very daring at a certain point in your life, and we were there. We were ready for it, so that's what but we I did. I will say, Asha took a bigger leap of faith than I did, because as the assistant head of school, I read all the narrative report cards of every single child, because I... I'm a bit of a stickler, and so I didn't want any narrative report cards going out that were not well written. So I literally would read every single one twice a year. And Asha's report cards, the way that Asha could talk about, write about children and behavior and classrooms was unbelievable. It was 
phenomenal. So I actually knew that Asha could write. Asha's experience with my writing was, please make sure you make it to the faculty meeting. I mean, she really didn't have any thing to bank on that I could put string together three sentences. But I actually had reams and reams of report cards that I was like, okay, this, this lady can write. But the idea was there. And when we often talk about our partnership, um, Allie has the, this ability to see a story from the beginning, the middle and the end. I mean, a, a big fantastical story with twists and turns and all the way wrapped up. And, and I knew she had a great concept and I wanted to join in with that. Um, and since we've been writing together, we found that a lot of my weaknesses are Allie's strengths, you know, and her strengths are my, you know, Matt, you guys know what I mean. Um, we're, we complement each other, you know, where she's great at these really huge, big ideas. I like the tiny, small detail, details. Um, I am kind of a... a, a punctuation nerd. So I, I really love commas and, and a well-placed word and <laughs> making sure that all of our tenses are correct and line up. Um, so it, it, that part's been a discovery, but it's been a lucky discovery for us. That sounds like such a great partnership. And it reminds me not of how we met, but Guinevere and I, I think similarly, we work because I will do things that she doesn't necessarily want to do. And she does, she does so many things that I'm like, I can't do this. Um, and so having that balance and the balance of brains and, and strengths is, is so important. And you started talking about kind of how that works as well. I do want to say Mary from Michigan asked, how, you, how did you collaborate to write this book? What was the process like? I think that's a little bit different. You know, were you each writing? You know, how did that work? Well, um, you know, we started every work session like this. Sitting down, checking in, talking about life. Um, girl, how is your husband getting on your nerves? Because I know mine is. Or what are the kids up to? You know, how did Lila do on her paper? Um, Allie's a huge cheerleader of my kids. So she's always asking what they're up to. Um, and a lot of that connecting time seems maybe could look like on the outside, like wasting time but it built on the trust that we had. It developed more trust in our relationships and it was great fodder for some of our characters as well. You know, we'd talk about my mom and Allie's mom and great aunts and cousins and, you know, mimic them or tell stories and go, oh, 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 we gotta put that in the book. That's good, that's good. Um, but checking in meant a lot to our working partnership. And we wrote, we kind of, call it literary leapfrog. Um, I will start off and I'll get like, and it's not pretty, but I'll get three chapters down just on paper. And then uh, because Asha and I have the shorthand of both knowing education in school so well and different child personalities that we know or adult personalities, I can write all sorts of notes to her and I can just put down a name of a person we both know that I'm trying to get that, we want that feel, but I can't do it. And so we have this great shorthand and those three chapters will go to Asha. I'll take the next three. And then while she's working on that, I work on that. And then we just, I don't know if it's leapfrog or like running to fartlek, but um, you know, it's like keeps going on down the line. And so we we work that way but we also on big scenes I mean, we literally kept when people think well who goes to starbucks at 6 a.m like uh we do <laughs> we'd sit at starbucks and we'd have a scene and you know it's like okay asha go and she just start talking and you know sometimes you just you just need the momentum and i just write type down whatever Asha's saying and it would go from there. So that was our in-person stuff. Sometimes if I'm writing something, I'm annoyingly calling Asha because I get very stuck on little things 14 times a day. What should this sentence be? 
Um, and then at the end, we spend a lot of time sitting at a table, reading every single sentence really, really slowly to each other. I mean, it's not, I'm, I'm sure that our process, well, actually, I don't know. You know, an individual writer um, may have more editing on the back end with an editor. By the time Ash and I, because we had each other, what we delivered to our agent and then to the publishing houses, um, our editor who ultimately bought it could not believe how far along it was. Our editing time with her was four months. It was really fast because it was a really clean book. So I think that, you know, others who write individually might get the book down faster, but have, once they get to work with someone like an editor, it might take them more time. Whereas we had each other to get it further down the line. I think, I, I, think? I have to, I have to ask too, because we had talked about this before and I actually asked that everyone bring a beverage, but did you have a beverage of choice beyond coffee while you were writing and, and what are you drinking today? <laughs> oh my God. Allie, so Asha, you're more interesting than me. You, you go. <laughs> I'm going to show a tried and true trick that I rely on. Usually I would go for a, um, a caramel frappuccino and then bring it home and spike it like with a little whiskey in it. <laughs> That's delicious. You should try it and ask for a grande in a venti cup so you get a little more room. You, then you can pour it right in there. But today I spiked my hibiscus refresher. Oh, that's healthy. Well, it's it's a sweetened kind. I don't think no, it's healthy. Not, it's, it's, it's a new one. But mm. you stick a little vodka in that and you got yourself a drink, sister. <laughs> but I rely on these all the time. My mm -hmm. Arizona iced tea. I go nowhere with it. Right, Allie? Yeah. I'm considering getting an entire outfit in these colors. <laughs> I'm sensing like a Halloween theme coming up. Right. Good idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I am just a hot tea drinker, even in the middle of summer. Um, there is something, I, I think it's like my lovey or my blanket that I just have to have the hot tea with me. Um, and right now I'm just drinking kombucha. I know it's so not entertaining. So not interesting. She never has to worry about me asking for a sip of her drink. <laughs> <laughs> I make up for fun in other ways. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Well, I'm drinking, um, I think I had mentioned I, I like spritzers. And so I have um, some house, um, uh, what is it? Floral, citrus flower with some bubbly water and a lemon. That sounds good. Um, well, I'm gonna jump in if you don't mind. So, um, you know, I live in San Francisco and I, you know, I, I know the private school scene unfortunately too well there. Um, but I'm curious about the setting. So you guys are both up in Seattle. And Ali, I know that you worked in San Francisco, but why the choice to set the book in, in San Francisco versus Seattle? Asha, can I jump in on this one? Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Now, I, I lived in the Bay Area for about six years. Um, so I know the city pretty well, but Ali's got a great story about this one. She felt yeah, there, there were a couple reasons. So one of one of them is Asha and I were both working in the private school scene in Seattle when Where'd You Go Bernadette came out. And Maria Semple is a Seattle author. And her book isn't even was never intentionally to be about private schools, but that's what people really attach themselves to with that book. And the fervor in Seattle of people trying to figure out, oh my gosh, and which school is it? And where, at the time, where's Maria Semple's daughter go? And there was so much chatter about the school and what it represented and where it was in Seattle that, and we both were working, you know, had worked in schools. Our kids were in private schools in Seattle. 
So we didn't want to go there was one reason, but also, you know, Seattle, there's some competition in private schools in, San, in Seattle, but it's nothing like San Francisco. San Francisco is the equivalent of New York. And we wanted to show the West Coast elitism as it is opposed to East Coast elitism. And, um, you know, Fairchild Country Day is a K to 12 in San Francisco. And that was also very intentional because the only true K to 12 is in Oakland at Head Royce. So we created a school that doesn't actually exist in San Francisco. We don't actually live there, but both of us know the city really well. So we could do it justice, but still make it fictional enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that, you know, when you're looking at, at, at parents and at white privilege and at that sort of mentality, like, it, it, it's kind of universal, but it is interesting the differences between, you know, the, the, the New York scene and the West Coast scene. Um, and one of the, one of the sort of, like, the, one of the aspects of the book that, that I really enjoyed in, in a very schadenfreude kind of way was, you know, the sort of, like, uh, the, the the tech bro aspect that you 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 got that in there and that is that is also you know so kind of unique to San Francisco and and Seattle um, and you know and 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 I know that one of the questions from from our readers was was a, specifically about the characters in the in the book um, and you know you mentioned earlier that you guys had sort of you know would would be taking notes of of things that actually happened and and parents that that you ran into or or students that that you had but um but what about for example you know the like how did you come up with the the the, the kind of character traits around um you know like like being a supermodel or like you know having like tapping into experiences that that were unlike your own did you, you know, did you talk to people in different fields? Did you research that or was it just your imagination at work? I wish we had a bigger answer than it was just, I think Asha would say that's like the weird places that Allie's brain goes. <laughs> it's true. You know, some of it is based so much on an amalgamation of the women in our lives and the experiences that we've seen from the outside. Both of Allie are both Allie and I are from um, families where our parents were been married and together for a very long time. Um, but in our lives, we've certainly had close friends, family members that have been single mothers um, from for a variety of different reasons. And when you're creating a character, you can borrow from so many different little memories that you have and piece those together. Um, and we had, you know, readers like my mom, who was a very early reader, she would tell us if it wasn't right. <laughs> you know, um, some of the things about live, coming from the South for Aunt Viv definitely came from my experiences visiting there um, and being raised up by older Black women who were all from the South. I'm my, let's see, my father's the first generation uh, born here in Seattle. Everybody before him in my family, all my ancestors are Southerners. Um, Washington State's kind of, it's one of the younger states and especially for uh, Black families living here. Um, so I had those characters around me. They were all transplants, but they brought the South right up here with them. And we used all of those memories together to create our characters, especially Josie and Aunt Viv. Um, and the Edda and the ballet really came from my, I, I'm actually 5'10", and I'm like strong Russian stock. I look like I could plow any field. But from the time I was very young, my grandmother um, always took me to the ballet. I was clearly never going to be a ballerina, but that was something that we religiously did. And my favorite book growing up was um, Portraits of a Ballet Dancer. And it was about a young girl in New York City going to the um, American School of Ballet. And, you know, I, 
that whole world I have always had such reverence for, but never actually participated in. Um, but both Ash and I, I mean, we laugh. We we grew up on fame. <laughs> and so, you know, between growing up on fame and my experience with my grandmother in the ballet, like it just, Etta just came and Juilliard just came to be. Um, so that was part of our time. We, we could just like singing, you know, the whole song. And all, well, I should say fame and my other big one, and I could break out in song, but no one wants to hear it is, I, I've probably seen a chorus line 15 times. Yeah. And, you know, the song at the ballet, like they're just such parts of our childhood being kids of the 70s that played into that. Awesome. Yeah, I now you're going to have that stuck in my head. And I'm like I thinking know. like gold lame leotards and top hats. And I know. <laughs> um, speaking of gold, uh, so Brittany would like to know specifically, where did Golden Boy come from? Did this really happen? Was this was was <laughs> tell us more. We want to know about Golden Boy. <laughs> Is where like our, our our naughty minds that were like we say the things people other people think but would never say um oh my god okay i'm gonna sound i'm putting it out there ash and then you follow up but i'm gonna sound so awful but um you know there is very much this this time in admissions of private schools colleges whatever that the sort of middle of the road person or middle of the road family feels like they don't have a chance. And whether that's good, bad, or in between, whatever, but that is a, f a feeling out there. So, um, you know, we're not the first to play on it. I remember watching mo a Modern Family episode when, um, when the two gay dads were applying to preschool and they thought they had it in the bag and then two lesbians and one had a disability and one was Native American showed up and they're like, oh, we've been trumped. Mm -hmm. um, so there, it came from that, like, how, how can I one up unique myself <laughs> to get my kid in school? So that's where it really came from of, you know, well, if you're an accountant in Jordan Park, you, you accountant, we work for Salesforce and you're white and you're in Jordan Park, like snore. Um, Have you right, experienced any anyone misrepresenting themselves on their admissions? Oh, um, you know, I don't know about on their admissions how far back, but people certainly have, you know, sidled up to me during the year and maybe during Black History Month when I'm teaching their child and said, you know, my great great grandfather is one quarter black. I mean, I'm I'm it, like, wow, we might be related. I I don't know what they wanted from that. Actually, I do know what they wanted from that, and that was just to get an in any way they could. And I understand the motivation because, like, Allie and I are quick to remember we're moms too, and that crazy mint can get in your head when it comes to your kids. And we just laugh at the crazy when it, it approached us and, and saved those little gems for our book. <laughs> well, you bring up a really interesting point. And, you know, I mean, this, this, is, this is quite a moment for, you know, for, for this book um, and, you know, and, and for authors in general, um, be, because publishing is having to have a real reckoning with itself and with you know with with black authors with diverse voices with you know own voices so you know pe people telling their own stories or be you know who 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 can you speak for as an author and the debates around that have been have been really heated um you know books like american dirt have um you know caused a lot of controversy and and uh really sort of divided a lot of people um what is it like, you know, both Asha for you as a black woman and then Ali, you know, working, working with Asha and, you know, and, and having your story out there um, in this moment, um, you know, what, what has that been like as authors, you know, as, as publishing is kind of in the throes of, of, of this, this moment? Well, 
you know, as a black woman, I don't um, feel like we're in much of a different position than we were 10 years ago or 20. You know, life is the same for me as it has been for quite some time. So it might be a shake up for a lot of white people, but this is everyday life for most black Americans. Doesn't feel that unprecedented to me. But what I would say is what my grandmother would tell me right now, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, jump on it, strike when the iron's hot. If you're popular right now, get your manuscript in and ride the wave because there's a reason and maybe yours is the voice that we need to hear. And I wouldn't, um, you know, cut off my nose to spite my face, any of those cliches. I would jump on it if the opportunity came. Um, that's what getting ahead is about. And maybe yours is the voice that helps bring equality into some of these industries. So um, that's what I would say. How about you, Allie? Yeah, well, you know, Ash and I, early on, we wrote this book together and we've said, you know, in the whole own voices movement, this is our voice together because Ash and I collectively have the experiences that make up this book um and i've been we've been asked like how could ali write a black character and you know yes josie our protagonist is black but she's also an only child and i was an only child she's a school administrator i'm a school administrator she grew up on the west coast went to school on the east coast i did too so for me, the who gets to tell a story is tricky. My, um, you know, it was interesting the whole American Dirt's um, upheaval. Part of me is like, who at what time gets randomly selected out? I don't know if any of you have read the book. It's a very good book, but um, it came out in, I think it was April, The Good Neighborhood. Has anyone read that? It's a really good book. It's written by a professor from North Carolina, blonde hair, blue eyed, and the characters, the majority of the characters are black, yet no one questioned her book. So it's also a very curious thing, like who gets, you know, are you just like the right person at the right time, the wrong person at the wrong time? Um, why some authors get uh, picked out of the lineup and others don't? My biggest hope, I absolutely believe, believe, believe there needs to be more voices of people writing. However, I don't want it to become that, um, well, we want more black voices, so we have more black characters. If a black author wants to write the most magical, fantastical book in the world, because that's their favorite thing in the world to do, that's what they should do and everyone should flock to read their fantastical book too. Um, you know, if a brown author wants to write about, you know, Europe, medieval European history and they can weave a great tale because that's their passion, awesome. So for me, it's more about allowing more equity across who gets to write less than here are the only people can, that can tell certain tales. Um, I, I get very nervous about that because I think that's creative censorship. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, I think a lot of, of, of what went wrong with American Dirt was the way that the publishers handled it and the fact that it was their key title and their marketing mm -hmm. budget and her advance and the amount of money and promotion that they put behind that bo book compared to, you know, the amount of, of sort of, 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 of effort and readership. And when you look at publishing in general, where you have, you know, less than 2% of, 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 of editors are African American, or when you have, you know, 3% of sales and marketing are people of color. And, and you start to, you know, think about like, well, these are the people who are deciding which books will be important. And, you know, and I think that that that, that is an issue that, you know, is has has sort of is long overdue for for being addressed. Now, Asha, I mean, if you are a grammar queen and you love punctuation, I mean, maybe you need to go become an editor right now because <laughs> Phoebe Robinson is starting no. her own imprint. Uh, zip and... it. Asha cannot leave. <laughs> zip it. 
All right, I have two fun questions. One is, we read that this book is optioned, so would love to hear your involvement with that. And who's your dream actors for, you know, you could pick one or two characters, whatever, but a dream actor to see, to portraying them on screen. We have a whole cast list. Ooh, yeah. oh, maybe yeah. you could just like share. No. <laughs> because but, you, you all are the only people that are, that are gonna care who we would cast. <laughs> Hollywood could care less who we want casted. Asha, why don't you talk about our journey to this point? Yes, of course. Um, Allie and I love, we love this part of, I mean, we missed so, going on our book tours due to COVID. We love the face-to-face. -face. So we're happy not only to see all of you, but when Hollywood came knocking, we decided, hmm, we should really go down and interview Besides, it's the middle of winter here in Seattle and I'm sick of my kids. <laughs> Vacation. So um, a few scouts, I guess, got our book to some studios and we got on the phone with several of them and had some great conversations about their ideas and their visions for our book. And we chose a handful to um, meet up in person. We flew down to Hollywood. We thought we were just really doing things then, and um, it was fun. We had a great time, and I s decided to work with ICM Partners in LA, who are TV film reps, and uh, then it was their turn to go off and see if they could uh, catch a bite from anybody who was interested in creating this book into a, a show, and gosh, Allie, when did we uh, get the offer from from a major studio. When did that come in, July? Well, I mean, it really, I'm gonna brag about us for a minute, Asha. Yes. Um, Own it. You know, we, so this all started happening last summer and our book wasn't coming out till May. So the fact that starting in July, 2019, um, we were, people are interested in repping us, which I have to say now with COVID, thank God. <laughs> because it definitely wouldn't have happened if they had waited for the book to come out. Uh, but so July was, or August was when we went down and met with all the different um, agents, chose our agent in um, December, we had been optioned. And so it went fairly quickly. We had a couple different offers. Um, I mean, we are, we are two women who have spent over 40 years collectively in schools. And in a very short time, we had to figure out the publishing industry. And then in a very short time, we had to turn around and figure out the world of optioning and negotiating and um, that whole world, which was a steep learning curve as well. Um, but it, you know, in that process, when you sell your baby off to be optioned, really Hollywood would just like to kick, kick you to the curb and <laughs> just let them do their thing. But both Asha and I, Tiny Imperfections is our love letter to schools. And we love schools and we love teachers. And though we make fun of them, we love the kids and the families in them. So the, there are many places that we negotiated, but one of them, you know, schools are not always, well, I would say they're, they're often one-dimensionally portrayed. They're either the horrible, bad, terrible public schools or they're the private schools with the ultra wealthy kids who are off their rockers. And there's not really anything in between. So part of our negotiations is much like um, legal movies or television shows have lawyers for consultants to get it right or medical shows do that we negotiate, negotiated, you know, Ash and I wanted the power to make sure that the school environment is portrayed accurately and with love. And, um, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be a comedy, but we don't want people to laugh at the school. They, we want people to laugh with the school. So that was a big part of our negotiation is making sure that we were there for that consult or we will be there for that consultation. But no script or no uh, casting input. 
No. <laughs> but we'll, we'll tell but you who's right Golden now. Boy? Like, come on. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Asha. Who's Golden Boy? Golden Boy we had in our minds as Chris Hemsworth. Yes. What do you think about him? Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Pretty good. Pretty good. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> like so Aunt, Aunt Viv, we've got three that we love we'd be happy so aunt viv is either and these two women you'd have to age them up a little but either octavia spencer viola davis or jennifer lewis mm. those are our aunt viv picks i you love that you rock- did that was this it was this like as you were negotiating or beforehand or after it or was this when you were writing the book but no, this, no, this is when we're when avoiding said, writing book number two. This is what Okay, we that was actually the next question too, is, <laughs> is where is this heading? Will we, are we, gonna, are we gonna read more about these characters or other characters? Oh, oh. Wait, I, I wanna hear, before you move oh. on to your next book, who, oh. do, who do you have for oh. Josie? Josie, we need help. Okay, wait, for Lola we have who do we have, Ali? Rashida Jones? We have Rashida Jones or Dasha Polanco, who's on Orange is the New Black. Mm-hmm. Um, here, we'll do our other ones quickly because Josie's actually hard. So for Nan, yeah. we have Chris, uh, Kristen Chenoweth or Amy Sedaris. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, either. Yeah. <laughs> for, for Rowan, this is my personal favorite but because I'm so in love with the show, but for Rowan, Daniel Levy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you, David. It's yes. Eugene Levy's son. They've done Schitt's Creek. Oh, Schitt's Creek. Yes. Also Got a it. writer. So like would be yeah. really potentially helpful to have, you know. Oh. I don't see if yeah. only people wanted to ask us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start the letter writing campaign tonight. Thank you. And Asha, who's our Edda? And then Edda, I had... Um, Letitia Wright, who was Shuri from Black Panther, or Logan Browning from Dear White People. I had her, both of those. Did you have another one for Etta, Allie? No, I'm, I like those. Yeah. Um, but but jo- jo- Josie were, because- Unknown, I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's been tough. Tough. My, we don't know if she has any comedic chops, but by just pure acting prowess and, look um rutina wesley she's actually juilliard trained and um she is on queen sugar she plays nova on queen sugar um and she was what's the other show she was on asha that you blood blood no what's that one? Oh, she was on true blood yes true blood. Um, so she has the the look we don't know how she has the humor so there you go if any of these actually pan out, you all will have known first. I mean, you, we heard it here first. We heard it yeah. here first. But okay, let's let's hear about the next book. Enough procrastinating, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, we have gotten the nicest notes from readers about wanting to hear what's next for the Bordelon family. What's going to happen with Donna Josie? Is Etta going to make it as a dancer? I mean, there's so much that people want to hear from um, what happens with this family, and we're super jazzed about it. But what we're learning about sequels and series books is that usually your second your number two book sells at about 80% of what your your first book sold. And during COVID, if your numbers are low and you got a low number for that first book, you're going to have a little bit lower for that second one. So, you know, right now trying to sell a sequel is, is going to be a tough sell. So we're hoping that this family gets to live on through us and through the show if it comes about. And maybe someday we'll come back to it in written form. But for now, we are sticking with what is our, you know, sweet spot for us. And that's writing about schools. And the, um, I mean, school is such a microcosm for the world. It's someplace every single one of us has been. 
You might not have ever been to a Swedish massage bathhouse or something. I've never been to one. How many of you have? <laughs> but you've all been to school and your children and their children and the product of school is people. I mean, the stories will not run out. So in some way, we really hope the Boardlawn women live on, but certainly our stories that um, live in schools um, will continue. And we're hard at work on book number, a second book um, that takes place in a school. Yeah. And, and then of course there's the rodeo. Well, yeah. <laughs> experience I mean, that is gonna have true. to come into play. <laughs> And one thing then I might have to like pull out the pictures from that era and no one needs to see that. <laughs> well, I didn't mention that I was in a circus mm -hmm. as a kid. So Allie and I actually had very kindred childhoods in that uh, we, we chose some very odd performance arts <laughs> as children, the circus and the rodeo. Did we want to run away at early ages, Allie, or what? Apparently, quickly. <laughs> You know, I, I one, one thing about our second book, we're, it's funny because there was definitely a period of time where we really struggled with the idea of like, oh, we're not going to get to write a sequel because we have this amazing story. And we were so attached to the Borderline Women. They've been our family. So figuring out, you know, there really has to be a time of separation and for a while we really felt like i mean i can't I, we're cheating on the, if we were start writing new book or new characters we're cheating on and viv and etta and josie and it just felt gross i mean i know that sounds weird but it felt kind of gross and it's been interesting as we're getting this we're kind of a third of the way through the second book a little more like at first i was i don't know why i like these people i mean you know it's kind of like i don't want new friends <laughs> and, but now we're really loving this new family and it's it's been really curious that that process and sort of having to mourn a bit the board alone not that they're going to go away forever but we did have to mourn them some and have some rocky writing and ugly writing to be able to shed it and get to another good place and you know, with this new book, there are some characters and some things that, about the characters that are very different than either of us. And, um, you know, when I think about that question of who gets to write a story, an own story, um, I still believe that we can write the story because we just re reach out to people who we know who are, are more like these people. I mean, we have, a, we have a black male character that it's like, we need some great dialogue. And Ash is on the horn to her brother, you know, and we put something in, it's okay, it's good. She calls her brother, he comes back with something and like, boom, that's it. So, you know, <laughs> you can write by virtue of your community and be, you know, fairly accurate for your characters. Yeah, so speaking of writing and, and community and your second book, I'm, I'm curious if there are, you know, if there's anything that you learned um, co-authoring your foot first book that you have kind of carried over or that you have changed this next you know, time around in, in your collaboration. We, we did try a new way of passing our book back in our, our chunks. You know, Ali was talking about sort of leapfrogging or playing pass and forth, back and forth together. We tried to share through Google Docs and editing and highlighting and things like that. It was a disaster from the outset on my part. I am so attached to handwriting things and that connection with my mind and writing things out. I have pads all over my house and my car and ideas struck me and I write them down. Allie is really adept at tech stuff. Um, and it just didn't work. So we went back to the way we did our first book, which I think kept the post-it note company in business for the past couple of years because I love post-it notes and we color code them. And it's almost like running a little classroom between these two teachers. 
Um, so we stuck with what we knew. We stuck with what we were good at and didn't feel the pressure, you know, to change for anybody, but just to do what felt right for the two of us together. And I would add, um, I'm laughing that that's what you brought up, Asha. I thought you were going to bring up. So I, as I said earlier, I'm an only child and Asha's the middle of, of three. So Asha's like the great collaborator, collaborator, negotiator, great patience. Um, I never had to learn any of that. So because of our strengths and weaknesses, we each had our lanes of what we did. And um, I would sometimes uh, eek over into Asha's lane and she would very kindly push me back over to my lane. Uh, I think this next time around, I am much more comfortable like completely giving up control over certain things. Um, and Asha's had great patience in me getting to that point. Um, I also, you know, I would, would want to say as the, as the white person in our team, when we were writing Tiny Imperfections, there were plenty of difficult conversations that we had to have about race and that Asha had to um, have patience with me and, you know, keep herself from rolling her eyes to the back of her head of something I said or asked her or like wouldn't accept. Um, and those were hard conversations. And the first time you go through them, you know, luckily we had this end result that we both really wanted to make sure got to the end. So we were willing to push through that, that ugliness. Well, actually it was never ugly, but the, you know, those hard things. Um, but, you know, now we know we can have difficult conversations and whether that difficult conversation is over something uh, based in race or it's over the choice of a word. Um, or I remember Asha, like sometimes in our final read, I get very stuck on something that's I know is really funny. Like it's pithy and it's funny. And Asha's like, Aunt Viv wouldn't say that. I'm like, yeah, but it's funny. It's funny. I swear. Nope. You know, and it's like, Asha would stand her ground and I would stand my ground and we just have to get to the same place. Some people would be scared of that tension and confrontation, but we made it through it a first time. So I feel really confident we can make it through a second time, maybe a third time. We'll see. <laughs> well, we're all looking forward to that. Uh, I am so grateful you guys joined us today. Thanks so much for asking answering our questions and our community's questions. I'm gonna actually uh, pause the recording now, stop the recording.